Okay. So welcome everyone. We are glad and excited to have Vera Top today. She is currently a postdoc at ETH Zurich, and she obtained her PhD from University of Bonn. She has received numerous awards, including best paper in Sora 18 and IPCO 21, and she was also the plenary speaker this year, NAPROX. And she has produced several breakthrough results in recent years, especially in her work in ATSP and STPAS TSP. And today she will talk about her breakthrough result on weighted tree augmentation, one of the notoriously hard and central problems in network design and approximation algorithms. So Vera, it's all you. Thanks. Thanks a lot uh, for the kind introduction and also for the invitation to speak here in the seminar. Um, so today I want to uh, present some joint work that I did recently uh, with uh, together with Records Inclusion from ETH Zurich. And uh, before we start, let me just say if you have any questions, I'm happy to take any questions during the talk, so feel free to interrupt me whenever something is unclear. So let's get started um, right away with the problem definition. So where the tree augmentation, the problem I want to talk about today is a fundamental problem in network design. And in the tree augmentation, we are given a tree G with vertices and edges that you can see in black here on the picture on the left. And then we are also given a set of X edges, and we are also going to, these are the, these orange dashed edges in the picture. And we are also going to call these X edges the links to distinguish them from the edges of the tree G. And all these links come with a non-negative or with a positive edge weight, which is given by this weight function W here. Now, in weighted tree augmentation, we wish to find a subset of these x edges, so a subset of these links, such that um, if we add the subset of the x edges or the subset of the links to the tree G, then we obtain a two-edge connected graph. And now this might, might seem like a very special setting that we restrict our starting graph G to be a tree, but in fact, we could equivalently start with an arbitrary connected graph, because suppose G is just some arbitrary connected graph and we want to turn this into a two-edge connected graph by adding extra edges, then we could just upfront contract all the two-edge connected components and we would end up with a tree, so an instance of this weighted tree augmentation problem. So this is just, yeah, so it's without loss of generality then that the input graph G is a tree. And so when we, in this talk, we want to talk about approximation algorithms for weighted tree augmentation. And there it's often useful to phrase this problem in a slightly different but equivalent way, namely to view weighted tree augmentation as a kind of covering problem. So let me explain what I mean by this. Um, so remember that weighted tree augmentation, weighted tree augmentation, our goal is to obtain a two-edge connected graph. So this means we want to make sure that every cut in the graph contains at least two edges. And so this means the cuts that we need to worry about are precisely those cuts that contain only a single edge of the tree G. And so in, so, so in a equivalent way of phrasing by the tree augmentation is to say that we wish to find, to cover these one edge cuts of the tree G by links. And so if I say that a link, like this blue link here in the picture, covers um, all the edges that lie on the path between its three endpoints, like this path PL here that you can see in green, um, then I can say weighted tree augmentation um, is a problem where I want to cover all the edges of the tree G by links, where a link is covering precisely those edges that are part of this path PL. So this is an equivalent way to phrase where the tree augmentation is a very useful perspective when designing approximation algorithms. And so as the title of my talk suggested, um, this talk is going to be about better than two approximations for weighted tree augmentation. But as a warm up, let me first show you a simple way of obtaining a two approximation for weighted tab. Can I just ask, a, so in, the, in the sort of illustration in the previous, uh, yeah, so yeah. here you're adding edges only between ED nodes, but that's sort of a 
special case, right? I mean, it could yes. be that it's like here. There, are, I yeah. think there, there are also some links, at least, like some going to the root here to the topmost vertex, which is not a leaf. We say here is a vertex which is not a leaf. It's just like coincident that in the solution these are only leaves. It could be in general. Links could can go between arbitrary. Okay, as a pedantic question, like the, what is the hardness, uh, NP hardness stemming from here? Like, I mean, yeah, just as a. Yeah, so the problem is it, it's, it's, it's APX hard and it's hard even on like trees with small diameter and so there are a lot of, yeah. So, so, so we, we don't expect the uh, peaches for this, but yeah, they, okay. I don't, we don't know any like particular. I'm not aware of any particular like explicit number of hardness for the hardness of approximation. Okay, okay, makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Okay, so let's see how we get a simple true approximation for this problem. Um, so this works as follows. So we first pick an arbitrary root vertex R, like the one on the top here. That's step one. And then we want to, in a second step, we split every link into so-called uplinks, each of them having a weight the same as the original link. So what do I mean by an uplink? So an uplink, like all these links in the middle picture here are uplinks, and an uplink is simply a link like this one here, where one of the endpoints of the link is an ancestor of the other endpoint of the link in the tree G. So this is the case for all of these uplinks here. One endpoint is an ancestor of the other endpoint in the tree. And one can observe that it's always possible, like here in this picture, to split a link, an arbitrary link, as you can see on the left picture, like this red link here, for example, into two uplinks that together um, cover precisely the same set of edges of the tree. So these red links here, these two red links here together cover these two edges, and these are precisely the same edges covered also by the red link here on the left. And so by doing this splitting operation, the, we should observe that the weight of an optimal solution to this instance can at most double. So this can increase by at most a factor two. And now what's the point of um, splitting all the links into uplinks? So the reason why this is a good thing to do is that if we have only uplinks in our instance, then in fact it's possible to solve the problem optimally. And there are different ways of doing this. One is to solve the natural LP relaxation uh, for this problem, which is integral if we have only uplinks. Another way would be to use some dynamic program bottom up over the tree, but in any case it's possible to solve this instance um, with uplinks only optimally in polynomial time. And then if we have this uplink solution, we can easily transform it back um, into a solution of the original instance by just simply saying that whenever we picked an uplink in our uplink solution, like that red uplink here, then we'll include the red original link into our solution. This original link will always cover only more than this uplink here on the right. And this gives us a true approximation because again, when we split every link into two uplinks, the cost of an optimum solution could at most double. So this is um, the simple true approximation. And there are also many other ways of how one could obtain the true approximation, like standard methods for network design, like primal dual methods, or yeah, iterative rounding. And there are many more ways of getting a true approximation, but this way is going to be also useful later on. Okay. So this is how we can get a true approximation. Yeah. So is there a natural, like a uh, intuitive way to see why the LP is integral in this case? It's a, uh, or it just happens to be. Uh, yeah, it happens to be, I mean, in fact, one way say like this, if you just write down the LP, that's uh -huh. for example, going to be like a network matrix or the, like, yeah. So it's in fact, yeah. It's not okay. too hard to see, but maybe, yeah. So that this is integral or yeah, one can also probably more or less directly construct optimal. So yeah. Also dynamic program is a simple way to seeing this. Yeah, but it's pretty standard if you write down the LP that this is 
Okay. Yeah. And another question is if, if you look at the natural NLP, but not for the uplink, but general problem, then what is the integral gap known for this case? Um, so there it's yeah, I mean, basically this this proof can can give you that it's, that the integrality gap is at most two. There are lower bounds that it's at least three half already in the in the unweighted setting. Um, but that's basically all we know. So yeah. Yeah, because this giant's two approximation for survival network design, it's a much general problem, and even for that yeah. you have a two approximation. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the layer like Jane's algorithm would of course also, yeah, it's one example that would also give another way of obtaining a two approximation here, and this is much more general indeed. Okay. Okay, so um, if there are no more questions about this two approximation algorithm, um, well, let me say a few words about uh, related work. So, there have been there prior to the work I want to talk about today. There hasn't been any better than two approximation known for the general case of weighted tree augmentation, but there has been a lot of work on special cases, um, in particular the unweighted special case, which is also often just called TAP, has been studied a lot, and there's been a huge number of results um, and different ways of obtaining better than two approximations there. The currently best approximation ratio is a 1.393 approximation. Then for you, another special case that has been studied before is like the case where we assume that the tree G has a bounded diameter. In this case, for this case, Cohen and Utov could show that there is a 1 plus L2 approximation. In fact, this algorithm is pretty important because I will later show you that like one of the algorithms I'm going to present to you today is can be seen as basically a generalization of this bound of this algorithm here by Cohen and Nutov to the general case where the diameter is not necessarily bounded. And then a third special case where better than two approximations are known is if it's a special case where an optimum solution to the natural LP relaxation has no small fractional values. And this was shown by Iglesias and Ravi. And so the result I want to talk today uh, is a 1.5 plus epsilon approximation for weighted tree augmentation for any fixed positive epsilon. And so the plan for this talk is that I'm first going to show you the most simple way I know of how we can beat the factor 2. This is going to be some so called relative greedy algorithm that achieves an approximation ratio of slightly less than 1.7. Then I want to show you how we can do better than this relative greedy algorithm and actually achieve this 1.5 plus epsilon approximation, which is the best approximation ratio we know today. And then I will see if time permits, I might talk a little bit about the main technical ingredient that we need to analyze these first two algorithms here that I'm going to show you first, and this is a certain kind of decomposition theorem, which is the key part, is a key part of the analysis. So let's get started with the relative greedy algorithm. So relative greedy algorithms are a somewhat general technique that also have been applied to other problems. So one example that you might might know is the uh, an algorithm for Steiner tree by Tsiolkovsky. Um, but there are also other applications of this. And so the general idea of a relative greedy algorithm is to start with a solution that is a rather weak approximation and is not as good as we want it to be, but the, solution, the starting solution is somewhat highly structured. And then uh, we iteratively replace parts of the starting solution by somehow stronger components in this way improve the water weak starting solution and obtain a good approximation guarantee. So let me show you what this means concretely in the setting of weighted tree augmentation. So we, the starting solution um, of our algorithm is going to be a true approximation. And so we start by computing such an optimal uplink solution, just in the same way as I showed it to you um, in our warm-up. So we have this, we compute an optimal solution consisting only of uplinks. Um, 
which is a true approximation to the original instance. And now we would like to make the solution um, a little bit more structured. And this means that we would like to make sure that every edge of the 3G is covered not only by at least one of the uplinks, but actually it should be covered by exactly one of the uplinks. And so for example, this brown edge here in the left picture is covered by both of these two green uplinks. And in order to make sure that it's covered by only one of the green uplinks, we are basically, will basically shorten one of these green uplinks, namely moving its endpoint along this brown edge. And as you can see on the right, and this kind of shortening operation is always feasible because we can always do that, this kind of shortening, because shortening just means basically pretend this uplink covers less than what it actually covers. And that's only sort of, this why we only make our own life difficult, more difficult. So this is always possible. And it turns out that by applying such shortening operations, one can always achieve um, in such an, that in this uplink solution, every edge um, is covered by exactly one of the links. So this is our highly structured starting solution. It's a true approximation, and we know that it consists only of uplinks and that every edge of the 3G is covered by exactly one of the links. Okay, uh, so that's the starting solution. And now we want to improve on the starting solution. And for this, we're gonna use this relative greedy approach. In this algorithm, we will always um, maintain WTAP solution that is the union of a set U that contains only uplinks and a set F that can contain arbitrary links. And initially, U is just this highly structured um, two approximation solution that contains all the uplinks and where every edge is covered by exactly one of the uplinks. And F is initially just empty. And then, um, as long as we make progress, so, so as long as the weight of our solution uh, decreases, we will do the following. We select some component C. Uh, for example, a component could be, for example, these, these two green links here that I show you in the picture. Then we want to add this component to our solution. So we add this component to F because it can contain arbitrary links, not just uplinks. And then, of course, if we add this component to F, some of the uplinks in U might become redundant. We don't need them anymore. So here in this example, these are these two red uplinks. They become redundant. And so they are contained in the set drop U here. And that contains all, all the uplinks for which everything covered by the uplink um, is also covered by the component C. So that's why the, these links become redundant and we can drop them from our current solution. And then we just iterate this until, as long as the weight of our solution decreases. And in the end, we return the solution that we have. So this is the idea of the relative greedy algorithm. And so how, the, how, do you the component? how do you select this component? Like, uh, yes, uh, yeah, that's exactly what I <laughs> wanted to tell you about next. So thanks for the question. Um, so that's the thing I haven't specified here is how we select this component C. And we, we are gonna choose this component among a certain restricted class of components. And among these components, we are gonna choose, always gonna choose the one, the component that minimizes the weight of the component. So the weight of what we add divided by the weight of, of the drop. So the weight of what we remove. So we always choose the component to minimize this ratio of the weight of what we add compared to the weight of what we remove. And that's why it's also called like relative greedy. So I uh, guess that the description is rather important right? in the sense that I could have picked C to be the optimal solution itself, in which case you would just jump to. So yeah, yes. So yeah, so we, we are not gonna allow arbitrary components. So choosing just opt as a component is not always gonna be allowed. Right. So that's why we have this restricted class of components. Uh -huh. um, I'm gonna show you like next how we how we choose the, the class of components because that's actually important. Um, that's kind of the, the main difficulty in designing this a good relative greedy algorithm is 
kind of finding a good restricted class of components here. Right, the trade-off between the drop and the sort of uh, complexity of finding C. Yes, exactly. So let me yeah get to that on the next slide. So we need to pick a good class of restrict good class of components that we allow in our algorithm. And there are two properties that we need for this. So the first thing is we should actually be able uh, to efficiently find a component that minimizes this ratio. Um, this is one property that we need, otherwise we can't even implement our algorithm. And the second thing that we need is that we want that we need to make sure that our algorithm has a good approximation ratio. So this means that um, we need good need that there exists good components that we can use to make progress. And more precisely, this means what we want is that as long as the way if 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 our starting solution u is still much more expensive than opt, so if the weight of u is significantly larger than opt, then we want that there exists a component for which this ratio here is small, so where we make progress, which means that the weight of what we add compared to the weight of what we what we can drop is significantly less than one. If we have this property, then we'll at least obtain an approximation ratio that is better than two, because as long as the stuff we, we as as long uh, at least if u is initially only a two approximation or close to it. Then the second property guarantees that until we replace the large part of U by cheaper components, we will always find a component that gives us a good, good improvement. And that basically gives you that we obtain an approximation ratio better than two if we have the second property. And so these are the kind of two properties that we need. And there, now the question is how should we define these components? And like one very natural choice would be to say, well, maybe we can just allow as components only constant size link sets. And indeed, this is what Cohen and Nutov did in the algorithm for um, trees of bounded diameter. And in that case, this property A here is trivial. We can just enumerate over all possible components. Unfortunately, there is an example that shows that using only constant size link sets as components, there will not always exist a good component that makes progress whenever we need it. And in fact, if we just use constant size link sets, the relative greedy doesn't have any approximation guarantee better than two. Um, another possibility that's natural is would be to allow arbitrary link sets. And then as you've pointed out earlier, um, if we allowed arbitrary link sets, we could always choose opt as a component. And in that case, this property B here would always be fulfilled um, because the weight of the component would just be the weight of opt and the weight of the drop here, if we choose the component to be opt, would just be all of you because if we add a full solution opt, of course we can drop everything from you. Um, so just say if we allow arbitrary link sets, this property B is trivially fulfilled. On the other hand, the issue is that it's not clear at all how we should efficiently find the best component. And in fact, probably finding the best component then is not much easier than finding the optimum solution right away. So this doesn't really help us if we choose arbitrary link sets. So the question is, is there some kind of good class of components in between? So something that is like structured enough such that we are still able to efficiently find the best component, but something that is general enough such that the, this class compo of components always contains a good component that we can use to make progress whenever we need it. And quick, quick, quick question. So do we have some understanding of this set drop u? Because in the sense that it's a set function, so it's like it maps subsets from the Link set to, but is it like is it submodular? Is it supermodular? So I'm looking at the denominator here. So is that a function well understood, or is it like really complicated? Well, I mean, basically, I mean, it's everything that is. Yeah, I mean, I don't know any like particular property like how you 
that it would relate to anything like submodularity or anything. It's just everything that is like covered by uh -huh. links in C. Um, but I wouldn't know like any particular property that I could tell here that would be useful. Right. Okay. So it's not. Uh, I mean, it's not specifically a nice, like a easy to understand fun, like analyze function. Uh, no, I'm not aware of any like yeah such property. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so do we know better than two approximation for quasi polynomial time or in quasi polynomial regime? Because if you have log n size link set, maybe one can do better, and then you can enumerate them in quasi polynomial time. Um, I think one could probably let me see. I'm not sure. Like the, the if you if you allow like the tree to have not constant diameter but a bit bit larger than constant, you probably get something from the Cohen and Newton proof. But um, I don't think it would give you quasi polynomial time for arbitrary diameter trees. Correctly, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So the question is, what kind of components should we choose here? And it turns out uh, that a class of component that works is what we call the k-thin link set. And so let me first give you the definition of what this, what I mean by this, and then I will see why these class of components is a good class of components to choose. So here's the definition. So we call a set of links. K thin, if for every vertex in the tree, there are at most k links for which this vertex V lies on the path uh, PL between the endpoints of the link. So let's go through this definition uh, in the example here on the right to understand it better. So I claim that this set of orange links here is too thin. And for, for this, we have to check this, we have to look at every single vertex in the tree, for example, this blue vertex V here. And then we go over the links and, for example, for this thick link here, um, the vertex V lies on the green path PL between the endpoints of the link. And then we can look at the next link and again, V lies on the path between the endpoints of the link. And if we look at the third link here, V doesn't lie on this path between the endpoints of the link. Uh, so here we see that this vertex V in this example lies on exactly two of these paths PL. And if you check all the vertices in this example, you will see that every vertex lies on at most two of these green paths PL. And this is why we call this component a two-thin component. And in our algorithm, the components we are going to choose are the k thin components for some constant k, and this k is going to depend on the epsilon that's appearing in our um, approximation guarantee. So that's the definition. And so why do these components fulfill the properties that we wanted to have? So the first property that we need is that we want to, want to be able to efficiently find a component that minimizes this ratio here between the weight of what we add and the weight of what we can drop. And this turns out to be possible by using them some dynamic program bottom up over the tree. So this is a fairly standard dynamic program. I won't go into the details of this, um, but basically you just do a standard dynamic program bottom up over the tree. And in fact, this definition of K thinness is exactly made up um, to make sure that such a dynamic program has polynomial one time. Uh, that's why we consider K thinness. In fact, for constant k, like the so the dynamic program is, is like a runtime is exponential in k or poly. Yeah, um, it's exponential in k. So, oh. so 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 yeah, we need constant k for the dynamic program uh -huh. to have polynomial well time. So oh. so the components will be k thin components for some constant k, and for this constant k, the dynamic program has polynomial well runtime. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Good. OK, so this is property A. Um, now let me get to property B, and that's actually the, the more interesting one to show. Um, this is this property that 
should make sure that there always exists a good component that we can use to make progress. Um, namely, if the weight of the uplinks to the left node solution are still significantly more expensive than the weight of an optimum solution, then there should be a component that we can use to make significant progress. And to show this um, second property, there um, we proved um, a theorem, which is like the key part of our analysis, and that's what we call the decomposition theorem. And so next, I want to first show you uh, the statement of the decomposition theorem, and then I'm going to show you how this decomposition theorem implies the existence of these good components, so how it implies this property B here. So um, here's the decomposition theorem. So what's the setting? We are given this a constant, um, positive constant epsilon, that's the epsilon appearing in our approximation guarantee, and we are given the set U of uplinks to the left from our starting solution, and they have the property that no two of these uplinks cover the same edge of our tree G. So these are these, these blue links here in the picture. And now the decomposition theorem um, tells us that there exists a partition um, of, an op of the optimum solution opt, that's shown in orange in the picture. So there exists this partition C of opt into one over epsilon thin components, such that we have the following lower bound on the weights of the drops. Um, so let's see what this inequality here says. So we want to lower bound the weights of the drop, um, and sort of the best thing that we could hope for is that maybe every single one of our uplinks in U is contained in one of these drop sets. And sort of the best thing that we could hope for, every uplink is covered by one of these components. And in that case, the sum of these weights of the drops would be lower bounded by the weight of U. And this decomposition theorem tells us that we can always achieve this lower bound, so up to a factor of 1 minus epsilon. We can lower bound the sum of the weights of the drops of these components in this partition by 1 of 1 minus epsilon times the weight of u. So that's the statement of the decomposition theorem. Let me show you why this implies this property B that we wanted to have. So here I copied the decomposition theorem, and let me just show you the proof of B because it really it's just two lines and fits on this slide here. Um, so in property B, um, we said, okay, suppose the weight of the remaining uplink is much larger than the weight of opt. Then if we plug in this inequality here into the decomposition theorem here, what we get is that the sum of the weights of the drops is significantly larger than the weight of opt. But the weight of opt is nothing but the sum of the weights of the components because these components form a partition of opt. And if you look at what this inequality here now says, is that on the left side, we have summed up over all components, the weight of the drops, and on the right hand side, we have the weight of the components. So this says, summing up over all the components, the weight of the drops, is significantly larger than the weight of the component. But that means that for at least one of these components, the weight of the component must be significantly less than the weight of the drop. And that means there exists an improving component. And so that's how this decomposition theorem applies this property B. And if you now calculate exactly how much you improve by single components and do all the math and do the calculations, you can show that um, you end up with the theorem here, namely that the relative greedy algorithm for weighted tab has an approximation ratio of 1 plus L and 2 plus epsilon, which is uh, slightly less than 1.7. Okay, um, good. So that's the relative greedy algorithm. Um, if there, yes? Yeah, so I might be nitpicking here, but so I mean, I see this applying at the first step of uh, the entire algorithm where you started out with a U and the F was the empty set, but as you progress, U stops being like a solution, like you're 
yes. sort of iterative process. So those those details do iron out, I presume. And yes, so you isn't necessarily a solution anymore. So at some point right. we just replaced a, a large part of you, and then then we just our algorithm is just at some point going to stop. Okay, so this like the decomposition theorem works for I mean, non solutions as well. Yeah, yeah. I just went back to that slide. So all we need is that U is a set of oh. uplinks such that no two of these uplinks uh, cover the same edge. It's not important okay. that U is a solution. Okay, got it. So it's just a, I mean, it's a downward close property. So, okay, got it. Great. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, are there any more questions about the relative greedy algorithm? That point, that might be a good point to ask, because otherwise I would uh, continue with the, the local search algorithm. Um, so you speak on, like, how do you prove the theorem is, is like? Uh, yeah, so, so proving the decomposition theorem, uh, yeah, that, that, that requires some more work. I will see if I have time, I can come to that a bit more at the end. Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah. So let me first show you a little bit of uh, how we can improve on this relative greedy algorithm um, using a local search approach. And so this local search approach, again, is again going to use the decomposition theorem. And by this, now, this way now, we can, we, with this local search approach, we will now obtain an approximation ratio of 1.5 plus epsilon. So we'll do better than this relative greedy algorithm. So the general idea is that like of this local search thing is that so far in this relative greedy algorithm, um, we always replaced only uplinks from the starting solution. All the components, if we added and if we added some added links or some component in an earlier iteration, we never removed this link from our solution. And now the idea in this local search algorithm is we also want to make progress and want to also want to gain something by possibly removing some links um, that we added in the previous iteration if these links become redundant. Um, so the difficulty here is that these links added in the previous iteration, like this example, for example, this link L here in the le le left picture, this is not necessarily an uplink. And this makes it somehow very hard to analyze um, when this link becomes redundant, because we would like to use this decomposition theorem again and this decomposition theorem also only tells us something about when like uplinks become redundant. So it was really important that these links that we want to get rid of, that these uplinks in U, that they are uplinks. And so the way we get around this in the in this local search algorithm is that we kind of view every link, so to say, as a as a union of two uplinks. Like similarly. Uh, as we did it in the in this initial simple two approximation. So for example, this link here on the left, we view this, imagine this as split it into two uplinks that together cover the same links, same edges as the link L. And we call these two uplinks here, these corresponding uplinks here on the right, we call this the witness set of the link L. And so one key idea in this local search algorithm is because we can only we are only good at analyzing um, when we can get, get when we cover one of these uplinks here in the witness set of the link is that we also want to reward so to say partial progress so we also want to we do not only want to minimize the cost of our current solution but we somehow also want to reward it if we make partial progress so we cover only one of these two halves of the link L here so one of these elements in the witness set. So this is like very vaguely like the general idea. Let me explain to you a little bit more concretely what that means. Um, so more concretely in this algorithm, we always maintain a current solution F, like on the left here, that can contain any arbitrary kind of links. Could be uplinks, but also other links. And then we always maintain a corresponding uplink solution um, which is just a union of these witness sets, so where we basically split every link into two uplinks. And because we later on want to apply, be able to apply the decomposition theorem in this uplink solution, we shorten links again, like for example, just shorten this 
red link here in order to make sure that every edge is just covered by exactly one of the links. But that's like just a technical detail. And so the idea is now that if we add some new component C to our solution, um, then of course we in, we in our uplink solution, we can uh, remove those uplinks that are covered. And as soon as for a link in our solution F here, both its halves, so both its up, the uplinks and its witness set are removed from the uplink solution. If both of them are covered, then we can also remove the link from our actual solution F. And then in order to somehow reward it, um, if we only cover one of the two uplinks, then this algorithm will not aim at, directly aim at minimizing the cost of the solution F, but we try to minimize a certain potential function that rewards partial progress. And this potential function is defined as follows. So here we sum, first of all, this first sum here, this sums over all the links in our solution for which the witness set of the link just contains a single uplink. And for those links, we just add up the weight of the link. And then for those links in our solution F, and where the, where the witness set has two elements, we sum up three half times the weight of the link. And so that's the definition. Let's see why this potential function is useful and how this behaves when we add some components and when we make modifications to our uh, solution. So here we just wrote the potential again, and the right you see our current solution F and the corresponding uplink solution, which is the union of the witness sets. Now what happens um, if we add a new link to our solution F and we add the corresponding witness set the link to the uplink solution U, well then the potential is going to increase, but it's going to increase by at most three half times the weight of the link. That's the worst thing that can happen if the link, uh, if the witness set of the link contains two uplinks. Now if we cover a link in our uplink solution U and remove it from the witness set WL of a link L, then the potential is going to decrease. And now there are two different cases to distinguish. The first case is when U is the only uplink in its witness set. In this case, um, after we covered U and removed U from the witness set, the witness set of the WL of the link L becomes empty. So here in the potential, um, the link, so the link L is actually going to be removed from the solution F. So the link, this summon W of L rate of L, the summing just disappears from the potential at all, and the potential decreases by the weight of the link L. If the witness set of the link L, uh, if U was not the only, only, only uplink in the witness set of L, then the size of the witness set decreases from 2 to 1, and that basically means that the link, um, that the weight of, of the link L here doesn't appear in this right sum here anymore, but it only appears in the left sum. So this means instead of adding three half times the weight of the link, we only add once the weight of the link. And thus uh, the potential decreases by half the weight of the link, which is exactly what's written here. And so this is how much the potential decreases. And one important observation here uh, is that this weight function W bar here on the uplinks so the amount by which the potential decreases when we cover the uplink U, this W bar weight function, just basically it, what it does, it is just distributing the weight of the link L equally among, among the elements of its witness set. So if U is the only element of a witness set, then just, the, just U just receives the full weight of L and if the witness set contains two elements, then each of the elements receives half the weight of L. And this is actually, this is going to be important. And in fact, that's exactly how this potential function is made up here, such that this weight function W, w uh, distributes the weight equally among the elements of the witness set. And whenever we cover an uplink U, then the potential decreases by this W bar weight of U. So, what I've just shown you is 
basically that whenever we add a component to our solution C to our solution F, then the potential is going to increase by at most three half times the weight of the component. And when I remove then the drops or everything that becomes redundant from the applic solution U, then the potential decreases by at least the W bar rate of the drop of the component. And I claim that together with the decomposition theorem, this, imp this implies that as soon as we cannot make progress anymore by adding a new component and removing the drop, then we have essentially almost this we have approximation. And let me show you the proof because it just again like fits on the rest of the slide. So here I wrote the decomposition theorem again. The decomposition theorem tells us that there exists a partition C of opt into one of epsilon and components such so that the sum of the W bar weights of the drop is lower bounded by one minus epsilon times the W bar weight of U. And this W bar weight of U is by the previous observation from the previous slide, just the same of the just the same as the weight of F, because again, this weight function W W bar just distributes the weight of F on the links in U. And combining these two things, we immediately get that local minima with respect to this potential or a good approximation, because suppose our current solution F um, is a bad approximation, so it's it's significantly worse than as we have approximation. Then let's plug in this inequality here into the decomposition theorem. Um, then what we get is that the sum of the weights of the drops is significantly larger than uh, three half times the weight of opt. And again, the weight of opt is nothing but the weight of the component, the sum of the weights of the components, because the components form a partition of opt. And let's see, if you look at this inequality now, what does this say? So on the left side, we have the W bar weight of the drop, but this is exactly the amount by which the potential decreases when we remove the drop from U. So on the left side, we have the potential decrease. And on the right side, we have three half times the weight of the component, but that's exactly the potential increase. So what this inequality here says is summing up over all components, the weight of, oh, so the potential decrease is significantly larger than the potential increase. So this means if I add the component and I remove the drop overall, uh, at least in some overall components, my potential is going to decrease. So this means at least for one of these components, the potential is going to decrease. So this is an improving component. And so this shows as long as we cannot make the potential smaller anymore, um, if, if we cannot make the potential smaller anymore, then we have essentially almost, at least almost, as we have approximation. So this shows basically that the following local search algorithm gives us this we have approximation. We can just start with F being an arbitrary solution to a tree augmentation, and U having the, being the corresponding uplink solution. And then as long as the potential improves significantly, we are going to pick a component C that maximizes this expression here. So this expression here is just simply the amount by which the potential, we expect the potential to decrease. Uh, so we want to maximize the potential decrease. Um, again, this component can be again found by some bottom-up dynamic program over the tree, similar to the relative greedy algorithm. And then we are going to remove the drop of the component from our uplink solution U. And if for some link, for example, this orange link here, the corresponding witness set becomes empty, then we are also going to remove this link from our solution F. Then we add the component to our WTAP solution F and also add the corresponding witness sets to the uplink solution U. And finally, um, in the uplink solution U, we shorten uplinks wherever necessary just to be able to apply the decomposition theorem uh, in the analysis. And we just do this as long as the potential improves significantly and then return F. 
And by the argument I've shown you in the previous slide, this algorithm is a 1.5 plus epsilon approximation for weighted tree augmentation. Okay, so that's uh, the local search algorithm. Um, or if there are any questions about this, uh, this might be a good point to ask. Um, otherwise, I will now maybe say at least a few words about how to prove uh, this decomposition theorem. One question, I mean, sure. if, uh, the bound does not in improve even if it's unweighted. Uh, sorry, once again, I just had an audio fall. So if the if the if you look at tap, not W tap, and yes. run the algorithm, I mean, still we get 1.5 plus epsilon by the analysis, I guess. Or do you think yeah. it can by unweighted case? No, I wouldn't expect this to be better than 1.5 in the unweighted setting. I think it should get the same. And uh, so another question is like, this is about 2H connected property, but let's say I want KH connected graphs. Then does this algorithm be modified? Or? Uh, for, for what problem exactly? So KH connectivity, connectivity. So you are proving 2H connectivity. Like you want to achieve KH connectivity starting with what kind of graph? Was the K minus, uh, yeah. K minus one connected graph or was it? Yeah, yeah, one connected. Let's say we have three graph. I mean, as you 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 have, and then you are adding links such that it becomes two H connected. Yes. Now, if I want KH connectivity instead of two H connected, so I have to have, add more links. Does this algorithm extend there, or there are some uh, like it's a different problem and. Um, it's, I think that's a different problem. So even just if I say, yeah, I want to in increase like, yeah, like these cage connectivity problem, there, there I think still factor two is the best we know. Yeah, so there are a couple of interesting uh, generalizations of, of weighted tree augmentations or connectivity augmentation problems where we typically for all of them, uh, at least in the edge connected, in the edge connectivity setting, like standard methods like Jane's algorithm or things like that give you a true approximation, but for many of these, nothing better than two is known. And yeah, it's a very interesting question to see to which of these problems we can extend these algorithms. But yeah, so far we don't know anything. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Good. So maybe you'll yeah, probably skip most of them, but at least if there's time, let me, let me say at least very few words about how we prove the decomposition theorem, although I'm probably going to skip most of it. Um, so let me just recap here the decomposition theorem. The setting was that we have this set of U of uplinks such that none of these two uplinks carry the same, same edge of the tree, and we have this W tab solution out. We have this constant epsilon and k is just one over epsilon. And our goal is to show that there exists a partition of up into k and components such that the sum of the weights of the drops is lower bounded by one minus epsilon times the weight of u. So basically, um, a slightly different way of saying this would be to say, we want to make sure that there's only a small set O, so a set. Uh, that makes up only an epsilon fraction of all the uplinks that remains uncovered. And then we want to construct a partition of opt into k and components such that all the uplinks in U without O, so all but this epsilon fraction of U is covered, where covered just means that all of, all of these links uh, in U without O are part of one of these drop sets. So that's what I want to achieve. Um, that's a slightly different way of phrasing this decomposition theorem. Let me maybe just go over the proof outline and, and skip the details in the interest of time. Um, so the way we prove this decomposition theorem is that in the first step, we just look at every uplink in U and we first fix the way of how we could cover our U. So we fix, for example, how we co could cover this path PU um, so, for example, in this example here, you see the uplink U, and in green, you see this path PU. And these orange links here together, these are links in opt, 
Um, they together would cover everything that's covered by you. So these orange links together cover the whole link PU. And kind of the idea behind choosing fixing this covering app U here is that we say if we want to cover the link U, so if we don't want to put it into the set R of uncovered links, then we want to make sure that all the links in FU are part of the same component. Um, because if they are part of the same component, um, then U will be in the drop of this component. And so a slightly, let me draw this in a slightly different way here. So in this white picture, all these circles here um, correspond to, 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 to links and opt. And here I just draw FU is just a subset of these links and opt. And now, of course, I pick such a covering FU, not just for one of the uplinks, but for every single one of the uplinks. So maybe I get all of these, like the blue set is the covering of the link U2, and the green set the covering of the link U3, and so on. So that's going to be the first thing we do. We first fix these coverings. It's the first step of the proof. And then only in the second step of the proof, uh, we fix the, we choose these uplinks in O that we want to leave uncovered. This should be just an epsilon fraction of all the, these should just make up an epsilon fraction of the whole set U in terms of weight. So maybe in this example, we choose that we don't want to cover this uplink U3. So that basically means we can forget about this green covering FU3 here. And having this done, now only in the very last step, we actually partition opt into components. And remember that what we wanted to make sure is that um, for every link that is not in U, uh, that is not in R, so that's in U without R, um, there is a component that covers this uplink. And um, because we fixed this, this covering here in the first step is because we now say for every link that is not part of R, we want to make sure that all the links in FU are part of the same component. Um, so this means all the links in the red set here should be part of the same component, all the links in the blue set should be part of the same component, and all the links in the orange set should be part of the same component. And so actually, if you now look at this, it's pretty clear how you should choose the components. The only reasonable choice is choosing everything here in the left connected component, all the links here as one component, and all the links in this right connected component as the second component. So the challenge in this proof here is to make sure that you make the choices in steps one and step two in such a way such that the resulting components that sort of result automatically in step three, such that they are case then. And like what we do in the proof is basically we construct a kind of auxiliary graph that is somewhat similar to this graph here on the, on this hypergraph here on the right, um, but it's actually a graph where similar to this picture here, the, the connected components of this auxiliary graph correspond to, com to the components that uh, in which we partition opt in the end. And the key part of the proof is to, that we are able to relate some properties of this auxiliary graph um, to the thinness of the resulting components at the end. And that's, so that's really what we're really magic of this proof happens, relating the properties of this auxiliary graph to the thinness of the resulting components. And so maybe in the interest of time, let me skip over the details of the proof and what I uh, conclude with a brief summary and some open questions. So in this talk, I've shown you two better than two approximations for weighted tree augmentation. The first one was the simple relative greedy approach that has an approximation ratio of roughly 1.69. And the second algorithm was this local search algorithm uh, that had an approximation ratio of 3 half plus epsilon. And a few remarks and open questions. Uh, first of all, like uh, I would like to remark that a similar algorithm to this local search algorithm that I've shown you can, so a similar approach can also be applied to the standard fee algorithm and there you can, with such a local search approach, recover the currently best known approximation guarantee um, of LN4 
plus epsilon, uh, which is due to Bilker, Grandoni, Wodfoss, and Sanitar, and would be interesting to see what are the further applications of this local search technique. Then another question that also already came up in the discussion today is what about LP relaxations? Can we come up with any natural LP relaxation for which we can prove an integrality gap of better than two? Then another interesting question would be to discuss talk about node connectivity instead of edge connectivity. And finally, there are several interesting um, generalizations of weighted tree augmentation for which currently a factor two is known, but nothing better. Also, this question came up earlier uh, in the discussion. So one question here is weighted connectivity augmentation. So this is uh, the problem where we want to have a, have a graph that has um, edge connectivity um, k, and we want to increase the edge connectivity by one unit to k plus one by adding a minimum weight set of extra edges or links. And for this, currently a true approximation is known, but nothing better. Another question would be to see whether we can beat the fact that two for the minimum weight to edge connected spanning subgraph problem. So basically, where we start with an empty graph and just trees, yeah. To minimal, yeah, a minimum weight set of edges to, to have that is that makes the graph two edge connected. And boy, of course, one can also look at, at minimum weight k edge connected with graphs and so on. So, there are even further generalizations, but we're looking at minimum weight two edge connected graph would be very interesting as a first step. And already, that's an important open question. Uh, so, with these open questions, um. I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any further questions you might have. So for the last question, this minimum two edge connected spanning subgraph in uh, subgraph in the unweighted case, uh, what is the baseline four thirds? Uh, yeah, yeah. In the unweighted case, um, four thirds is the best one currently, yes. And for node connectivity, what is known for this problem? Let's say I want Two node connected. What is the base known? Is it factor two there? Or, or? Um, I am not entirely sure if you want to have the minimum weight connected. And for node connectivity, no node connectivity is actually harder. I'm not entirely sure. It's something about six, maybe, I think. But I'm not sure. Maybe there is also some battery in the weighted setting. I'm actually not sure about this. Um, but generally, like node connectivity often is significantly harder than edge connectivity. Um, so because basically all these iterative rounding approaches, they at least don't work as they do as they work in the in the unweight uh, in the edge connectivity setting, which is basically because many things like uncrossing and so on don't work in the node connectivity setting as they work in the edge connective setting. So understanding node connectivity seems to be somehow significantly harder than understanding edge connectivity. So it is much less known. And so that's why I think that's actually a very interesting research direction. Thanks. So there was some result by uh, Afroj Jabalameli, Fabrizio Gandhani on some weighted uh, connectivity augmentation. So, or like, I think maybe I'm that wrong. Was, that was, I think it was unweighted. So they had something on unweighted connectivity augmentation where they gave the first better than two approximation at some point. Right. I think probably that's the result you haven't had in mind, but that's unweighted. Yeah, so for unweighted connectivity augmentation, um, better results are known. In fact, um, some like the result, in fact, for in the unweighted setting currently, like for connectivity augmentation, and tree augmentation, the best known approximation factors are the same. So in the unweighted setting, everything from for known for, for tree augmentation could be extended to connectivity augmentation. But in the weighted setting, we don't know. Thank you. Any other questions? Hey, so the, uh, the APX hardness is known even for uh, the unweighted case? Yes. Okay, so even that doesn't have a PTAS as of yet. Yes. Okay. And are there like, is it interesting to look at the problem for like certain classes of trees? So like uh, maybe the trees that say come out of tree embeddings or 
uh, like by like simple like boundary degree trees or so on. Uh, because, because beyond diameter, like are there other restriction for which uh, restrictions for which like better guarantees are possible? Yeah, I mean, like in the in the unweighted setting, there has been some some work that was like looked at. Like actually, it's not really restricting the tree, but there was some work by Nutif who considered the case where we only have links that going from leaves to to from one leaf of a tree of the tree to another leaf. So we only have these leaf to leaf instances. Um, but in fact, like that makes only sense to look at this uh, in the unweighted setting because in the weighted setting, this is actually without loss of generality, so you can always assume that you have um, uh, leaf to leaf instances. Um, I think you can all, could also assume in a weighted setting that you have a bounded degree, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure whether you can assume both things simultaneously right now, um, but there are some, some kind of, so some of these properties you can just assume, yeah, without loss of generality by doing some simple modifications to the tree and Maybe in some cases adding some zero cost links hmm. and so on. So so yeah, but I'm I'm not not aware of at least of any any particular work on any special cases at like at apart from this leaf to leaf setting in the unweighted case. Like the yeah. it having some graphical metric or some kind of special property is something better known there. Um, can you just repeat the question? I Okay, no, it does not make sense. I was thinking if the there's a metric on the graph, like a graphical metric or something, maybe it does not make sense. No, I guess the question could be that what if W satisfies like the triangle inequality? Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering whether we can always kind of like like modify the tree a little bit such that there is not not that much. Uh, like there are not many that many pairs to with pairs of links to which you could apply the triangle quality. I mean, in some sense, you may assume that it does apply. If, actually, I think you can even assume that the triangle inequality is. Um, could you let me think about it. Can we assume that? Okay, no, not necessarily. But isn't it like if I have if I take two links? And hmm. that that just that have a common endpoint, and if I just uh, then basically, so I have a link going from A to B and a link from B to C, and what I would like to say is that the link going from A to C is not more expensive than the other two links together. But I think that's without loss of generality because then instead of buying a link from A to C, I could just buy the other two links. Right. Uh, so I think that's actually even in the, in the general case, that's just equivalent. We may assume that without loss of generality. Right. I guess I was wondering if even if the, I mean, while you don't use it, the tree edges might themselves have like some length or weights that doesn't show up in the algorithm, but so you might have to look at endpoint, like links that don't share an endpoint and then. Yes. So those, but yeah, maybe complicating things too much. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, like, so W on the links plus there's a W prime on the tree edges says that all of it together is a metric or a satisfies triangle inequality. So I guess like one way to think of it is like your input is this entire graph with a tree given on top. So the, um, and the tree comes for free, but W as a whole satisfies triangle. But yeah, okay, maybe you're right. Yeah, like but if, but if yeah, but if the tree yeah, yeah somebody tree. I mean, I do the tree. If if the tree edges all have weight zero, then of course like satisfying the triangle inequality would mm -hmm. just say everything should have cost zero. And if just the tree edges don't play any role because they are not like we just don't need to pay them, they could just be large, so they just wouldn't matter at but all. I guess. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker again.
thanks very again for the excellent talk thanks talk so very nice yeah good